it's a process that began with the end of the Cold War. Uh, there, the thinkers, particularly in the military and intelligence community, were, were, were beginning to say, well, you know, what does security mean now that there isn't this, Im this imminent threat that, that we've been facing for decades? And they began thinking quite seriously about the extent to which environmental degradation was a threat. A threat to security in, in, in the sense that, they, that they've always understood it, which was threat to your national frontiers from, for example, massive arrival of illegal refugees, um, threat to your national institutions, threats to your vital interests like uh, importing petroleum freely. And they began to, to broaden the notion of, of security. First of all, still confined to the state, saying, what is it that makes our country secure? And uh, uh, lack of buildup of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases, or closing the ozone hole, or not allowing biodiversity to disappear became uh, a sound concept when thinking about the future security of the state. But then the thinking went beyond the state, saying, well, what is security? Security is really the security of livelihoods, the security of communities. And that made it much more direct, much more specific. If you're looking at how to sustain a community or sustain a livelihood or sustain a set of traditions, then you have to look at the whole web of, of social interactions the whole web of environmental and resource management relationships. And uh, that thinking is, has matured quite a bit over the past few years. And now there's a sense that environment is not, some, is not a luxury. It's not something that, because we are good at heart, we devote time to and attention to if, if we have a bit of spare time in our day. It's brought environment right to the center of major public policy concerns. So if, if environment is re relevant to terrorist attacks or freedom from terrorist attacks, suddenly environment becomes something that has to be dealt with at the highest levels of policy. Recently they published the, the report of the Commission on State Sovereignty, and the main conclusion of that commission was that the concept of state sovereignty is linked to the duty to protect. And if a state is not able to protect its citizens from violence, uh, from poverty, from misery, it, it begins to lose its own authority, it begins to lose its sovereignty. And I think it's time that we extended that notion to sustainable development. If the state can't protect its citizens from unsustainable development, the citizens will begin to uh, turn away from it. They won't turn away in despair, they'll turn away and, and look for creative ideas elsewhere. I'm absolutely convinced that solving the, the, the problems of sustainable development no longer lies with governments. I think they've lost a great deal of their legitimacy. Uh, they will continue to lose their authority and they'll be replaced by other things. What those other things are, I don't think we know exactly, but I think we know some elements of them. I, I believe strongly in partnerships between government, civil society, the private sector. I believe in networks. I believe in uh, global public policy partnerships that take on a very specific issue, bring all the stakeholders together, and really aim at solving them. I think it was Winston Churchill that said that democracy is the worst system aside from all the others. And, and uh, the question is, we, we, we've had democracy in the formal sense. We've had elections, we've had candidates presenting themselves and winning or losing. We've had the processes in parliaments and so on. What I think we're discovering now is that we need a, a form of deep democracy. And one of the things that makes me hopeful is, is watching the convergence of sustainable development thinking, human rights thinking, and uh, governance thinking. And the concept that governance now is not about uh, the processes of elections or parliament or, or, or how candidates are presented. It has to do with transparency. It has to do with the right to participate in those decisions that affect your life. I think what I tell a, a northern viewer who, who hasn't followed the process of doesn't really take a strong interest in the issues, is that uh, there is no possible way in the medium or long term to isolate themselves from what's happening in the rest of the world. It, it simply won't be possible. It's, it's not even possible now, but it, it won't be possible in the future to maintain, the, maintain their privilege in, as a kind of gated community and, and hide behind those walls. The world is, is much too interconnected now, and those who are poor and, and desperate will simply not turn over and die quietly. They, we see it now already with the, the social disturbances that are spilling over borders. We see it with the refugee movement, the illegal refugee movement, the, the, the pressure on, on Europe and other countries from people who have no other options. And, 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 and to simply dismiss it, to put it out of the public eye and say this is not something we want to deal with, is, is, is really not an option.